A century of progress passed, and Virginia again became a mother state, this time in the political formation of an American nation. Its sons were leading voices among the founding fathers. Patrick Henry issued the famous call for liberty. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. George Washington led the American armies to victory. James Madison was chief architect of the U.S. Constitution. John Marshall became the greatest of the chief justices of the Supreme Court. Six of the first ten presidents of the United States were Virginians. For 40 years, the new nation, including Virginia, enjoyed uninterrupted progress. Agricultural productivity increased steadily. Canal building and the coming of the railroad shortened distance between two points, and those cities soon became commercial centers. And at the top of the list stood Richmond, Virginia, which could soon boast of the Tredegar Iron Works, the largest such foundry in the entire South. And yet, the dark cloud of slavery loomed above, growing heavier and darker with the years. It was like a storm waiting to explode. Abolitionists were persons opposed to slavery on moral and humane grounds. They also felt it was incompatible with American democracy. Slaves had no rights in the United States. They had no civil or human rights. In most southern states, it was illegal for slaves to learn how to read and write because reading and writing led to education, and education led to ideas. Ideas led to self-expression, and self-expression led to the idea that a person should be free. Arguably one of the most important events of the 19th century, certainly as it relates to the Civil War era, is the publication in 1852 of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a novel written by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Prior to this point, Northerners could agree that slavery was wrong, but Uncle Tom's Cabin showed them it was wrong because, among the other reasons, is the ease with which slave families would be split up and sold. One of the biggest threats uh, to slaves is that of losing a loved one. Um, and not just a loved one, it could be the whole family being split apart. Um, a lot of times when planters go off to buy slaves, it's not always uh, taking the whole family. He takes what he needs. And sometimes it's just the women and children. It could be just the men. It just depends on what their job is. In such an atmosphere, a small spark was going to produce a great flame. It came in mid-October 1859 in the person of John Brown. A lifelong failure in every business venture he ever undertook, John Brown became a fiery apostle for the abolitionist cause. He convinced himself that the elimination of slavery could only come through the shedding of blood. On a rainy night in October 1859, John Brown came here to Harper's Ferry. Brown and his band took refuge in the small fire engine house here at Harper's Ferry. The detachment of Marines sent up from Washington stormed the building and with club muskets and bayonets easily put down the insurrectionist. Brown was quickly tried and convicted and just as quickly publicly hanged at nearby Charlestown on December 3, 1859. Neither North nor South was in the least ready for a war, especially a civil war against each other. Few Americans had any idea of the immense demands this war was going to make. After all, emotion had replaced reason, and heated feelings existed where cool logic should have been. The war aims of the two sides were simple. The Confederacy was fighting for independence. The North was fighting to preserve the Union. Compromise? No compromise is possible. One side must conquer, and the other side must be conquered. A few days after Virginia's secession, Governor John Letcher named Robert E. Lee to command all of the state's military forces. Lee was a nationally recognized soldier with 30 years Army experience. He had a first-rate mind and a dignified bearing. Lee had become a Confederate because his native country, Virginia, had followed that course. Before the military operations could resume, Virginia was witness to a big step in naval history. 
And in March of 1862, Confederate Navy Captain Franklin Buchanan took what had been the USS Merrimack, but was now the CSS Virginia, out into Hampton Roads and attacked and destroyed two Union warships. But the North knew this was happening, and so they were building an ironclad too, and it arrived that same night, the night of the 8th of March, 1862. And the next morning, those two ironclads, the CSS Virginia and the Union's Monitor, which was a flat-decked ship with a turret right in the middle with only two guns, fought each other in the first battle ever between ironclads. They fought all afternoon, and neither one succeeded in doing serious damage to the other, so that it was a tactical draw. But at the end of it, the Union was able to stay in Hampton Roads and continue to maintain its naval superiority. The Union offensive was barely underway when word came from west of the Blue Ridge that would force Washington to change his plans and withhold almost a fourth of McClellan's army to protect the capital. Out in the Shenandoah Valley, Stonewall Jackson, with a force barely large enough to be called an army, was wreaking havoc. First two Yankee armies were sent against him, one from the north, one from the west. He beat first the one, then the other. In six weeks, Jackson would march his army nearly 600 miles, fight five battles, capture innumerable tons of supplies, and send 60,000 federal soldiers reeling in retreat, and all with his own army of barely 15,000 men. Jackson had turned around the war for Virginians in the spring of 1862, and he'd shown that while he could stand like a stone wall at Manassas, he could move like the wind in the Shenandoah. The only way for a soldier to communicate with his family or sweetheart at home was by writing a letter. More written correspondence occurred during the American Civil War than at any other time in our history. Handwriting was usually crude, and men often spelled the words the way they pronounced them. Still, there was nothing more precious to a soldier's eyes than receiving a letter from home. Next to letter writing, music was the most uh, popular diversion for soldiers north and south. In Virginia, songs such as uh, uh, The Bonnie Blue Flag and Dixie and When Johnny Comes Marching Home are perennial favorites, whether they were on the march or in the campgrounds. In fact, the war would generate over 2,000 new songs, new songs to stimulate nation building north and south, songs to get soldiers out of the parlors and into the regiments and into the fields of march. Songs that can be used, however, to remind one of the home that you've left, Home Sweet Home being one of the favorites north and south. It's around the campfire that the soldiers so often would remind themselves of home, thinking about the loved ones that they had left, the horrors that they were fighting for. Yet the folks back home tended to be attracted to the songs praising the glorious boys in their wonderful uh, gilt-buttoned uniforms as they marched away proudly in the regiments. Virginia soldiers complained the most about food, as well they should. When in camp, they received food on a fairly regular basis, but on a march or in a battle campaign, they often had to go hungry. And thus, over and over, the Confederate soldier had to make a decision whether to endure the pain of an empty stomach or the upset stomach that came from eating tainted meat, which they called salty dog, and moldy bread, which they termed worm castles. Many of the soldiers here in the Confederate section of the Old City Cemetery in Lynchburg, Virginia, died for lack of clean, potable water. They had contaminated creeks, they had foods that were ill-prepared, they could not clean their, cleanse their wounds properly. That led to much of the illness, much of the despair, much of the destruction, and much of the death during the Civil War. The thing that most enabled Virginia soldiers to endure all the hardships of war was religion. In worshiping God, there was hope and safety. Hundreds of recruits went off to war carrying little Bibles with them. Men would gather in large numbers whenever a chaplain or missionary appeared for a field service. Of course, the great test for these young Virginians would be how would they stand in the day of battle. Certainly they feared death, but perhaps even more, they feared that when the moment came, they might lose their courage and turn and run. For if they did so, it would be in full view of the young men they had grown up with, their friends and their comrades, and word would inevitably get home. <laughs>
Wounds certainly could occur, and they weren't so fearful of wounds. A nice decorative scar to take home after the war would even be a sign of their great service, what the writer Stephen Crane would later call a red badge of courage. This is the parlor of the Wilma McLean home at Appomattox Courthouse. This is where General Lee and General Grant came to talk about the possible surrender of the Confederate Army. This is where the Civil War would end. Lee was immaculately dressed at this table. Grant sat at that table in an old, weather beaten uniform. The conference lasted two hours. The terms of surrender were very generous. The horsemen would be able to keep their mounts. The officers would keep their sidearms. All the Confederate soldiers would be able to go home by authority of General Grant. There would be no prosecution for treason. There would be no revenge that would poison the peace. The terms of surrender were actually an act of kindness. And General Grant made it so when that afternoon he issued a short announcement to his army the Civil War is over. The rebels are our countrymen again. Civil wars don't normally end on such a high note. But thanks to Lee and Grant, this one was different. We are at Hollywood Cemetery in downtown Richmond. Behind me is one of the largest monuments to Confederate soldiers. More than 700,000 men died in that war. In proportion to modern population, the death toll would be six million. Those who survived the war soon began to realize that they had been part of the greatest event of the 19th century. And as these veterans grew older, they began to bond together in a mutual sense of accomplishment as they commemorated what had been and what they now were. Johnny Rebs never apologized for what they had done. Billy Yanks never asked them to do so. And so with this common legacy which they forged, they left a gift to us, to all Americans, for all time to come. <laughs>